Good morning and welcome to the Community Summit. Um, and after a long, long DrupalCon, it's so nice to see such a big crowd of people here today. Um, the Community Summit um, has been going on for several years and um, it's usually um, very unconference focused and wh what we found the last couple of years is it kind of dribbled off um, after lunch or at lunch. So we've tried to um, create a little more structure this year. Um, so what we're gonna do is we will have a panel um, speak first thing, then uh, we have a demo and our morning is, is largely concerned with events, Drupal events, other than DrupalCon. Um, so I'm sure you all know that DrupalCon is managed by the Drupal Association. And this event is purely um, managed by community members. So uh, we have support from the Drupal Association in the person of Joy Garrett, who I'm sure most of you have met um, during this week um, to make sure that we get on the schedules and stuff. But um, past that, it's up to us what to do with the day. Um, so I'd also like to, I, I put committee intros on, on this slide, but this year on the committee, I'm Catherine Carruthers. Um, I'm a site builder from near Ottawa, Canada, and I've been doing Drupal for about 15 years. And um, the reason I'm involved with community events is that that is how I have learned everything in my life um, with regard to technology. So uh, forming and attending user groups and camps and that kind of thing um, is like aside from the learning, the um, networking, although I hate that term, the meeting people who are experiencing similar things or have previously experienced similar things and are able to get you through them um, are invaluable in your career. Um, so how, how we're structured is that we'll have a panel. First, uh, this morning we have a panel of the event organizers working group. So these are the people who put on the camps all across the continent. Um, I don't think we have anybody from Europe here today. Oh, do we? Awesome, okay. All around the world, we have camps. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so I will um, have that group come up now and take over. Hmm? <laughs> She's staying, she's just getting organized. <laughs> Let's, let's do not that. Yeah. I, do I? Uh, <sighs> yep. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be great. 
pretend I'm, you I'm are a little less nervous. That's fine. Yay, technology. Oh, we were only both speakers, right? No, oh, that's the way it's here. Trying to connect. Thank you, we're trying to connect. Now I need everybody to get off the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> we're very needy. Did, did anybody, anybody have some bits? Can you send us some bits, please? <coughs> Yay! Oh, maybe uh, not. Uh, maybe not. Yeah. Where? Yeah, yeah, where there is. Where's where did the speaker notes go? Oh, there they are. Great. I've done this before. <laughs> okay. Good enough. Awesome. Okay. We good? You're good? Cool. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are uh, representatives of the event organizer working group. Uh, we're here to talk about community events, as uh, Catherine said. And just um, thanks uh, to Catherine for having us and uh, putting, putting the day together. Um, yeah, so the way this is going to work, um, we're a panel. Uh, the goal is to answer your questions. Um, we have some questions of our own that we are posing to ourselves, um, but we're going to have time for audience questions as well. Uh, first, quick introductions. My name is Avi. Um, uh, I have been the organizer, the lead organizer for MidCamp for the last three years. Uh, I've worked on it for, for over 10. Um, I'm also uh, on the Midwest Open Source Alliance, which is a fiscal agent for a bunch of camps. Um, I'm the president of the event organizer working group. And uh, in my paid time, I work for ImageX uh, on YMCA websites. Uh, Nika? Good morning, everyone. Okay. Well, I think it's going to be really close. It's not on. It's on now. Okay. Um, I no, am a co organizer for Drupal GovCon. And I am also a board member for the umbrella organization, the nonprofit organization, Drupal for Gov. And my nine to five, I am a director of web development at DS Federal. Mike, me? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mike Richardson. Uh, I am the treasurer of Drupal South. We organize the Drupal South um, event in Australia and New Zealand. I'm also the chair of the Drupal Asia Steering Committee, and we are organizing DrupalCon Singapore. Um, uh, in my spare time, I run an enterprise Drupal hosting company in Australia. Hi everyone, I'm John Picozzi, uh, Solutions Architect at EPAM, uh, organizer of the uh, New England Drupal Camp happening in November in Providence, anybody wants to go. Um, I'm also a member of the Event Organizers Working Group. Cool. Thanks everybody. Um, so if you're not aware, uh, there are a lot of Drupal events happening every year. Um, this is just a selection of what's going on. Um, from now until the end of this year. Um, I can't even, we've got Drupal Camp Belgium. What is, I, there are a ton of camps. I'm not gonna try and uh, figure all these out. But uh, yeah, so um, the, the great news is there are events happening all over the world, uh, hopefully in a city near you. Um, the goal of all of our events is to have a local event that's, that's close to you, that's accessible um, to, to not just folks who can take the time and money to come to DrupalCon. Uh, and um, all of these events are volunteer run. 
Um, so that's, as Catherine said, the big difference between what we do and what happens at DrupalCon is that it's made by, by you. Um, and so that's kind of what we're trying to, to talk about today and empower you to do. Um, you can go to drupal.org slash community slash events, uh, and you can see the list of all of these events as well as more um, near you. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, we're gonna dive into the questions. Uh, the first question that we have been discussing as a group um, and as a community lately is how can data guide our event uh, measure what's important and help the global community. So um, Nika's gonna take this to start and then we'll kind of, we'll continue from there. So I have a question. How many people have heard of Drupal GovCon? Oh, awesome. I'd like to tout that we are the second largest Drupal camp held in the United States. And our last event was in November of 2023. And it kind of, COVID kind of changed the game, right? Uh, it was, so this was our, 2023 was our first conference coming out, out of COVID. And so our attendance wasn't normally what it usually is. Normally our attendance is a thousand people. So we use data to help us measure a lot of things. It helps us determine the types of networking events we have, the number of sessions we have, the number of sponsors that we need. Can you flip to the second? Oh yeah. So there are a number of things. We, we are interested in who's actually attending. Higher education, nonprofit, how many government, our sponsors are also interested in, in this information, you know, because they also provide the training for it. We want to know who, like from a career level perspective, who is attending our conferences as well as the Drupal skill, because that plays a part into the types of training that we provide. So during our conference for 2023, we did something a little different in order to collect metrics. Normally when we collect metrics, after the conference, we send out a survey and we get that feedback. But this year, we actually had our interns walk around individually to each person to fill out metrics and to gather that information. Because what it does, in addition to helping us better provide services for our sponsors, it also helps us understand what we did wrong and what we can do to improve it. So our metrics come from a number of different ways. Surveys, we send out event brights, so we gather those metrics. We also um, do other things to kind of gather the metrics that just make it helpful for us to basically understand and properly plan out our conference. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I know um, DrupalCon, you know, has a long history of, of having its, its data out there, um, but one of the things that we haven't been as good at uh, as, as local community events is, is collecting all of that data together. Um, so now, now that we have the um, community events page on Drupal.org, um, one of the, the kind of thoughts we've had um, is, is how we can kind of pull all of this data that all of the other events have been collecting over the years um, and, and use that to kind of guide the community as a whole. Um, that's an open initiative if anybody's uh, interested in, uh, in helping out and thinking about how that could work. You just lost your screen. Oh. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I think the... <clears throat> The career level is super interesting to me because I notice, like you know, sponsors are probably definitely really interested in that executive yeah. 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 area, right? Like we we need, you know we want a, a diverse you know uh, cross section of career levels, but uh, you know, sponsors probably really gravitate towards that towards that executive. Matter of fact, I just I just took this slide and dropped it in the uh, Ned Camp chat. It's like, hey, we should take these when we have people sign up for tickets, like. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so. we've been doing that too. We, we mostly take the questions that DrupalCon asks 
uh, pare them down a little bit, and then put them on the, on the ticket sales. And so mm -hmm. it's a good way of getting consistent data um, and trying, uh, yeah, trying, trying to, the other thing about data collection, anybody who's done data collection will tell you, you wanna ask the same questions over and over and over. And if you change the questions every year, then you're gonna get different data. Yeah. So Mike's, Mike's been doing this uh, with uh, the, the developer, developer survey. survey. Yeah. yeah, so I run, I run the Drupal developer survey, which asks Drupal developers all over the world about who they are, um, what their interests are, where they work, the languages they use, and everything else. Um, and that data year to year is very useful, um, but seeing it over as it trends from like 2018 until now, and you can really see where every, where everybody's heading is is where it gets really valuable. Um, whilst I whilst I'm, I just want to add something else on data, I think um, one of the things that I've seen with post event or pre event surveys is that they tend to ask questions without knowing what answers they're looking for. So I I find in the surveys that I've run that the shorter they are, the better the responses are, um, and it's probably there's a lot more value in asking five or six questions than there is in asking 15 or 20. Yeah. Um, and it, I would start at the end. I would say, what, what is what is what I want to know? And one of the things you want to know is, um, you know, this this sort of data. Who are my attendees? Are they in are they in buying groups? Are they decision makers? Because sponsors will want that information, and then design the questions from that perspective mm -hmm. rather than just saying, "Did you have a good time?" Yeah. yeah. Um, we had a hand up there. Uh, we don't have a mic to pass around. I'm going to have you talk, and then I'll try and repeat yeah, what you're saying. Really yep. <laughs> so, um, by the way, I'm the first to meet. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you guys have have insight. I mean, I think my my insight looking at it would be like, okay, well, you know, if you're entry level, maybe maybe you're a novice, maybe you're a beginner. Uh, I mean, you could also be mid level and still think that you're kind of a, a beginner, right? Like it it really comes down to. Um, you know, it's a little, little bit of a uh, little bit of your, you know, your own opinion of, of what your you think your level is at. Yeah. And maybe. Ma and, and maybe it's also attributed to how often you go. I, I think a lot of the first timers are like entry level and novice, mm -hmm. and so that may attribute to the numbers. Could also one thing I will I, I will get there. One thing uh, also that comes to mind is like you know there could be a little bit of a, a career shift there, right? Mm -hmm. Like you could be a junior developer, but then like hey, I just got put onto this Drupal yeah. thing. Now I'm now I'm a junior dev, but I'm also a beginner at Drupal, right? So that could be a possibility. Amy June. My current level is a junior, but I don't have any Drupal skills. Mm. There you go. Amy June's a uh, walking case study of that of those metrics right there. Thank you for that. I'm not in Drupal right now, but I still go to events because it's relevant. But that's, <laughs> that's sort of the source. Too. Yeah. Right. The types of attendees though varies. Um, we don't all always have developers, right? We have project managers, um, executive level, so mm -hmm. it, it it spans. This is such a good, thank you for asking. Yes, it is. Primarily it is. Yeah, uh, the question was, or is this primarily to share with sponsors? So, so I'm actually gonna take that information because our, sp our sponsors wanna know, so yes. But it also kind of educates us to who we are serving. But our sponsors, these are like one of the main questions that our sponsors ask us. So, so conversely, or maybe as a follow up to that, if you're, are there target percentages or audiences that sponsors specifically want to see? Like, do they want to see like hella executives so they can market to them versus say entry? Like, are, are there demographics that are more valuable to sponsors at your camps than others? Yeah, absolutely. The question was, are there demographics that are more valuable to our camps than others? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it depends for sponsors yeah. what they're looking That's to get right. out of the camp, right? Yeah. So, like, I know from um, sometimes from our standpoint, right, when we're sponsoring a camp, um, we'll look at you know how many executives are going to go, how many qualified leads are we going to get out of that out of that camp, right? Yep. Or yep. you know, hey, we have these three open positions, like we actually. You know, we would love to meet executives and get leads, but we also need to do some recruiting. So, you know, it's very important to see those see those metrics to be able to say, okay, like here's a camp that like focuses on the sector we want to be in, and you know, the people that are going to be there meet the kind of the goals for that, you know, for that year. And it, and it will vary by sponsor as well. Yep. Some Absolutely. sponsors will want to market directly to developers and nobody else. Some sponsors <laughs> will want to market to C suite and nobody else. So, it really depends. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep us moving because I think uh, David's question ties really greatly into our question number two, which is how do you retain sponsors and attract new sponsors? Does anybody know the answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a checkbook that they want to open up right now? Um, so I think there are a couple of couple of different ways, right? So let's let's break this down into two two pieces. How, you know, how do you retain sponsors? Well. Great segue, right? The first one is showing existing sponsors value and showing them, hey, we're growing in attendance, we're growing in these sorts of uh, career paths or, or, or audience uh, demographics. Um, we also, the New England Drupal Camp, we start really early, right? So I mean, we, uh, you know, we're uh, a camp towards the end of the year. We're usually in November. And, you know, by the time we get to November, if we were to start two or three months out, Right, most of the budgets have been agreed to. Most of the budgets could potentially have been been spent by then, that point in time, right? So we actually start pretty early. Um, I think for this year's camp, we started uh, reaching out to sponsors, um, existing sponsors, uh, in you know in January, right? So right at the beginning of the year. Um, so I, I, you know, I think for the retention piece of it getting out to them early, getting on their getting on their radar, saying, hey, yes, we are having a camp this year. You, you know, here's where it is. We'll keep you updated. That's important to retention. Um, and then attracting new sponsors. Uh, I think one of the things that we've tried to do in the past couple of years is um, kind of get off the Drupal Island, right? So funny story, actually. We have for the last, I think, three years, maybe maybe four, but for the last three or four years, we've actually had a pest control company sponsor our camp. Mm -hmm. And like the sponsorship showed up and I was like, what? I'm like, listen, I'm gonna take your money, don't get me wrong, but the, <laughs> I mean, I guess people in the Drupal community may need pest control. Um, another thing that we're doing to kind of help sponsorship efforts that we just did this year, I think Midcamp already has a prospectus. You, you guys, yeah, yeah. So we we actually put together a prospectus of our camp for for sponsors, new and old, this year, and taking some of those some of those stats and some of those figures and putting them out and saying, hey, this is this is an event you want to be at. And here's here's why. Yeah, and I think Midcamp has. Um, we kind of had the like PDF prospectus kind of more formatted. We kind of went back to just like, here's a web page that's our prospectus because we have the internet. Uh, but I think a lot of people want that like one pager uh, PDF that they can toss around with executives or whoever's making the decisions. Uh, I think having both of those, both kind of the longer narrative and the kind of one pager to, to pitch um, is, is really important. Um, John is also talking about kind of scheduling pre predictability, um, being able to tell sponsors a year out, uh, six, nine months out um, is really important. And so we always try and schedule mid camp. We try and get our dates um, like 12 mm -hmm. months in advance. Um, yeah, so I think yeah. most of the camps are trying to do that. Um, Nika, you had, um, you've got the, the yeah. GovCon yeah. metrics too. Yes, so one thing I wanna add is that we try to, it's, I think it's all about building relationships to and a way to keep our sponsors connected we do a webinar on every month and we use that as a sponsor benefit mm -hmm. uh, for, as a out of coming out of GovCon and so those webinars kind of keep us engaged and connected to our sponsors mm -hmm. so we are showing another slide for our sponsors by year and excuse the uh, 
interesting, it's small, but <laughs> if you look at the blue, the highest one, the highest bar, that was before COVID. And after COVID, we had online GovCon, Drupal GovCon, and that was interesting. So it kind of shows the numbers of the sponsor support that we had before COVID and then after. COVID kind of changed the game with regard, with regard to um, in-person um, con um, conferences. Yeah, I'll echo the, the relationship piece of it um, because, you know, a lot of a lot of camps went digital during you know during COVID, and like we actually reached out to our sponsors and said, hey, like, do you you know, like, we had already taken sponsorship dollars. We're like, we're not gonna have a camp because of you know this this thing, and you know we said, hey, do you want your do you want your money back? You know we we are committed to coming back you know next year or the the year after depending on what it looks like. Um, and you know a lot of our sponsors were like no you know keep it push it forward you know we, we you know we know you guys put on a, a good camp if we didn't have those relationships with them chances are they would have been like no I, I want my money back right um eric i think you had a question yeah. i have a question about the decline um did you notice that if there was a difference in like how much they were willing to sponsor as well or is that the, something so i've heard that, that it's actually increased we actually increased the question. Have incre that is a good question. We've actually, it, they don't really care. I believe that the, our sponsor prices were reasonable, probably more than reasonable, right? So increasing them after COVID, it didn't matter, right? The value was still, the value that we were providing was still there. So. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. go ahead. I was going to say, I, I thought I might just add a little perspective. If you're thinking of starting an event for the first time, you've got to build those relationships and demonstrate that value from nothing. So we're kind of, exactly. we're going through that now with DrupalCon Singapore where I've just spent the last three days going to all of the exhibitors here um, and, and yeah. presenting the idea of the conference and talking to them about the opportunities in, in Asia and in Singapore and in markets like Japan and India. And with different sponsors, you get a different level of feedback for some of them. You get the, okay, well, when, you know, how many people are gonna go, what, what is their profile? Um, you know, how much is it going, like what is our return on investment going to be? And a lot of that data just doesn't exist yet. It's been eight years since there was a DrupalCon in Asia. Um, and a lot of it is sort of finger in the air stuff. And some sponsors will look at that and say, well, when you've got data, let me know, I'll come. Um, and for us, you know, we have to make sure that first year is successful. We have to make sure that we have sponsors in there. So it, it's very much about crafting a, a long-term vision for the project and saying, to them, we need you to get involved early so we can work with you to grow that. And I think my, my number one takeaway would be if you're starting out and you're building a camp um, or, you're, or you're building some sort of conference, work with sponsors to talk to them about how it's going to benefit them, not just in that year, but in the long run. If you bring a camp to your city or to your region, that will grow the number of Drupal developers, it will grow the number of Drupal customers over three years, five years, 10 years and that's good for them in the long run. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna keep us moving. Um, do, so we've got some spaces for audience Q&A um, in here. I think maybe we'll just keep going. We've got a bunch of questions, but keep asking questions as you are. Um, the next question is, how do you get the word out about your camp? Um, so I'm gonna take a little bit of, of this to start. Um, as we've mentioned, um, the drupal.org slash community slash events, um, the, the, the Drupal, um, you know, that's a great way to, to kind of start the process, um, but we all have to do a lot more than that to, to market our events. Um, so Martin's gonna talk in a little bit about the event platform. Uh, so we've got a whole kind of starter kit for building your own event website. I know for MidCamp, um, that was a challenge for us for a while. Um, having web developers make a website was, uh, was, a, was a thing that was shockingly hard. Um, <laughs> But then also getting the word out uh, across platforms and figuring out what's effective in that. Um, so, you know, we have for a long time um, used social media and email marketing. Um, you know, having uh, somebody to do analytics on that is, is a, a thing that is important and we haven't had that for a while. Uh, we kind of know where we're selling tickets and when we're selling, sending posts out and sometimes we can connect those dots, but uh, 
you know, if you can connect the dots better through analytics, that'll give you a little bit more. Um, one of the things that we saw with MidCamp this year, uh, we had a great marketing team, uh, thanks to, to Rosie and Imagex. Um, and, uh, and we saw that um, we didn't get good, um, at least responses to social media until we started uh, putting speaker, uh, speaker names and, and sessions out there. Uh, and we were promoting for three months or more before we had the session selected. And like, there wasn't a lot of interest or at least like clicks on LinkedIn and reshares. Um, and as soon as we picked our speakers, um, those numbers and the engagement shot up. Uh, so so um, being able to kind of be on top of those pieces of the event, um, getting speakers in early, uh, I think is a, is a really important part of that. Um, I, I would also add giving giving your speakers and your sponsors resources that they can promote the event for you, like anything you can do to make it a bit easier for them to, to share or publish information about the event. Once, once, they're, once they're going, they want to tell their friends, they want to tell their colleagues, and that will just naturally help as well. Yeah, that was, that was one thing. It's funny, Avi, Avi touched on this, but like um, get, sometimes getting web developers to, to build websites is hard, right? One thing that, that we did a couple of years ago, and, and I'm sure I think a lot of other camps do this, but like we, <laughs> simple, super simple, right? We got the session page on our website, right, to have the right open graph data and the right metadata to be able to like produce a good looking card. We had somebody upload images to support that. So that way when you say, share that link on social media, it looks good, right? Super simple thing that makes it a lot easier for speakers and other, other people to be able to share just a link to the site and get kind of all the information that they need. Um, I think one other thing is like word of mouth, right? Um, I appreciate Eric's shirt. I'm wearing the same one. Uh, you'll all notice on your tables there are stickers for various camps, right? There are ways to kind of promote your camp in you know, these settings, uh, other conferences that kind of get the word out that like, hey, you know, if you live in this geographical area or you want to travel to that geographical area, there, there is a Drupal camp or a Drupal community there that um, you can visit. Um, that, that's, a really, that's a really interesting topic. We did share cards for MidCamp this year, but didn't connect them to the, the pages on the site. Um, one thing I've like, thought about for like 10 years and messed around with a long time ago is trying to create dynamic like share images. Uh, I've never seen anybody do that in Drupal or at least contribute it. So that would be cool uh, to like create a little share image from the data on the page with the title and, uh, and uh, user image and, and all that stuff. Other folks, yeah. No, I think you all highlighted a lot of the important things. I, I'm a walking billboard for uh, Drupal GovCon. So. Yeah. And then the webinars and the other trainings that help like get the word I will out. say I will say later on this afternoon I'm going to be talking about kind of like Drupal resources for for beginners and and like a lot of those are actually really good spots to kind of promote your camp. I see a new over there yeah. he's trying to trying to ask a question or make a comment but you know the drop times is super supportive of camps. Yep. You uh, you want to add something a noob go for yeah, it. Go yeah. for it. Speakers are, speakers are extremely powerful Yeah. Yeah. So just to re repeat for the for the recording, uh, using speakers and leveraging speakers to do their own promotion, giving them the tools to do that is a is a really powerful thing. So yeah. Thanks, Anup. Okay. Um, we're gonna we're gonna keep moving. Um, so uh, have you seen decreasing attendance? And if so, what do you attribute that to? So Mike's gonna start this. Um. Yes. Immediately after COVID. Absolutely, it was very hard. There was a lot of buzz. People were really excited to be able to go to in-person events again. But I think there was still, you know, in 22, and even in early 23, there was still some trepidation. We've sort of started to see the curve come back a little bit um, with, with our more, more recent event in Sydney. I think it helped a lot to have it somewhere 
it was really accessible for people. Um, one of the things, I think this is global, but I, I can certainly say that it's true for Australia. Um, companies are hiring less at the moment and, they're, and budgets are tighter, so they're less likely to want to send their teams, which is also feeding into having less sponsors because sponsors aren't looking for talent. And that's the main reason they go to Drupal camps. It's not really to find customers, it's to find talent. Um, and if they're not hiring, it's hard to get the justification for it. I feel anecdotally like that is reversing now and we're starting to, you know, there's an opportunity to start ramping up again. Um, I'm really, really excited about Starshot and the um, opportunity that represents to bring people back in. So I'm, the answer for me is, is yes. I attribute it to more economic factors than anything else, but I'm, I'm excited for the future. I'm feeling bullish about the next couple of years. Definitely. Yeah, I expect our numbers to increase. Pre-COVID, we had 1,000 attendees, and our first year back, we had about 600 plus, and we are shooting for 750, 800 for this year. So I expect to see positive results with our attendees. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you also have to look at kind of content and how you um, like what you're what you're offering right so every year and I, I think a lot of camps probably do this but every year we kind of look at what what the ned camp offering is going to be for that year right um last year we actually added um a um higher ed summit uh on the first day of the camp which is typically the training day you, uh, we had trainings as well and you know it was the first time we did it it was it was pretty successful. A lot of people showed up and we actually already have interest in it for this year's camp. So, um, you know, massaging that content, thinking about your audience a little bit more can also help you to um, increase your attendance. Um, as far as the decrease, you know, I think one thing um, I feel I, I, that I've seen is a, a lot of people, uh, you know, are like, well, you know, I don't necessarily have to go to the camp because usually the videos are online, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I think we gotta, in some cases, double down on the on the community aspect of like, hey, you're making connections, you're making, you know, you're making, in some cases, you know, um, connections that you 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 may have for for years or lifelong connections, right? So. That piece of it is important, as well as as well as the educational piece. Yeah, with with Midcamp this year, we we tried to, to work on that. I think we've got a better uh, an even better schedule for next year. But trying to intersperse um, structured content uh, sessions with uh, like more facilitated um, unstructured content. So um, we tried just doing boffs one year and being like hey, you've got two hours, like sit in tables and talk to each other. Um, and we got a lot of feedback that for a lot of new folks coming into the community, that was a, a, a pretty hard, um, it was a pretty inaccessible way for them to kind of engage in conversation. Uh, this year we had a facilitated unconference, so we got everybody in a room, did the post-it note exercise, putting everything on the board, self-organizing tables, uh, but we saw a drastic increase in participation there um, because we, we showed you know, you, you have to show people that there's something going on and just saying like, hey, you're gonna come talk to great people isn't really a value proposition that somebody new can take to their boss, can, can you know, pitch as a, as a thing that's gonna be valuable. Even though we as, as organizers who've been doing this for a long time know that like, they're, they're really amazing things that, that come out of those conversations. Uh, okay, we've got another slot for Q&A. We do have two more questions, but we're kind of, uh, we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, so. I want to open it up to the room a little bit, and then if we have time, we'll we'll kind of keep going. But what what questions do you all have? Um, what uh, what's on your minds about events? I have a question. Okay, uh, Mike. Um, and it's it's not for the panel; it's for the room. I'm just curious: is there anyone here who wants to run an event for the first time, and is and is here specifically because they're thinking about doing it? Ha. <laughs> Oh, one hand, yeah. We got one. Be brave. We're not going to make you commit to it or anything. Yeah. Um, we got one back there. Okay, another one. Can Can you all? Uh, yes to the first, but no to the second. Like I'm interested in it, but I'm not here specifically for it. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, what is there something that we can tell you specifically as someone who's interested in running a camp for the first time that we haven't covered yet? The pay is great. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so the question, the question was, what more can we give to sponsors? Um, because the, you know, as we've seen, you know, it used to be leads, and then it was jobs, and if there aren't jobs, um, what else can we give to folks? I saw a couple, yeah. So one of the things I think that might be helpful is to not always just say, I have to start with a camp. If you have a local user group, yeah. maybe that's a good thing to start to try and generate some interest and get other people who might want to help you with the camp. Uh, but to have regular uh, user group meetings is often a lot easier. Yeah. You may not need sponsors, you just need a space, um, and can try and help jumpstart that. Yeah. I think that's New England Drupal Camp came out of years ago from like local user groups all banding together and saying we should really have a camp. Yeah. So yeah, engaging the local community in, in smaller events and more more things throughout the year. I think that can also help benefit sponsors as well. Um, you know, we have uh, the Chicago um, meetups are, are at uh, office of an agency that's downtown, and so they they have the benefit of getting their name out and, and sharing um, you know their their resources. I will say to that to that question, like uh, uh, I'm not going to mix words. Sponsorship is hard. Like every year, sponsorship is hard. You know, uh, as I, I think Mike had said, like. You know, a lot of companies are paring down and like, you know, the first thing to go is like, hey, we're not going to sponsor as many events because like, you know, we prefer to pay somebody's salary. Right. Um, which, you know, makes sense. So I think I mean, you just really have to be creative. I think that's that's kind of the, um, you know, the, the, the thing is like what's going to attract people to want to give me in some cases a large amount of money to run run a camp. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, one thing that we do is like, obviously we've, we've actually looked at, um, Mike Miles, who's one of my uh, co-organizers has actually built a, a spreadsheet of, of camps and their kind of sponsorship levels, both inside the community, outside the community and like kind of what you get and how much it costs and all this other stuff. And one thing we added this year was, um, was add-ons so like hey you can do this lower level sponsorship but then you can buy everybody coffee or uh, you can you know pay for video recording and um, you know pay for lunch and so kind of like breaking it down a little bit to get people more interested in like oh hey when I go to get a coffee there's gonna be a sign that says you know has my logo on it and said I bought everybody coffee right which is it's gonna resonate more with the community so getting creative is is a good thing and again focus on your community mm -hmm. right and your sponsors care about connecting with your community. So even little things like if you have a t-shirt and putting your sponsor logo on that t-shirt and your email blasts and things of that nature go a long way. But it, we've been so creative in creating like add-ons and. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that as well. We, we've kind of shifted focus from you know, sponsoring a booth to sponsoring things, mm -hmm. coffee, yeah. rooms, Wi-Fi, um, you name it. Uh, and one of the things we've started doing in Australia is the Splash Awards. So Splash Awards have been really, really instrumental in um, bringing new clients to the event, which, you know, uh, uh, sponsors want to bring their, they want to submit their sites that they build for their clients, bring their client to the event, see them win a trophy at the end of the first day. It's been hugely successful. So trying to create these opportunities for sponsors to align their brand to something, whether it's coffee or wellness or health and safety, yep. whatever the case may be, be creative with that and have a range of options for the sponsors who want to work, they want to send their team, they want to have a booth, they want to have a giveaway, something like that, but also the sponsors who want to support, but maybe don't have the time or the resources or the capacity to fully staff an event and do big displays and everything else, but they can say, right, okay, well, we want to be on a t-shirt, we want to associate ourselves with caffeine, we want to associate ourselves <laughs> with wellness. What ca the coffee sponsorship always goes first. Yeah. Um, so those, those can help. And the other thing that I would say that helps long term, um, at Drupal South we do this, at DrupalCon Singapore we're looking to do this, which is the first company to sponsor something 
will retain that sponsorship for as long as they keep coming back. So if you become mm -hmm. the coffee sponsor, you get first right of refusal next year. So you can basically um, be guaranteed, so long as you treat it fairly and you're okay to you know, handle price increases, you can be guaranteed to come back every year and have that be consistently aligned with your brand. Uh, and that, I think, helps a lot for starting out as well. Nice. I thought I saw a hand back there, but then I saw Amy June and then Dan. No? Okay. Yeah, Amy June. One of the small attempts on Help Organize, we found it easier to have an altruistic sponsor level of 350 to 500, mm. where there's not a lot of value out for the sponsor, but it's easier to get 10 of those mm. than the 3,500 to 5,000. Yeah. yeah. So that's one way you can get a little bit more money in a case like that. Altruistic, I'm just sponsoring to sponsor. Yeah. Right. So I, having, a, yeah, having an, an accessible... Um, kind of low low dollar level sponsor yeah. level we also added like a community sponsor to our ticket so that way you can buy a ticket to our camp for uh, you know whatever that cost is but then you can add a 50 or 75 dollar you know community sponsorship too which is which is great yeah. yeah we have a we have a individual sponsorship level uh, which is also associated with a ticket and we always bring in you know at least a thousand dollars that way right Dan um, yeah, I, I wanted uh, just to just mention one, one of the more lively things we talked about in our camp planning is, is around pricing. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously sponsor dollars are important, but like how much can we, knowing what we spend per user, like should, uh, why are you know, we kind of undercharging? And also like, I'm just curious how other camps Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll just repeat the question. <laughs> everyone, then, everyone has oh something boy, to say. Here we I'll go. repeat yeah. the question off, David. So the question was around ticket pricing. Uh, just we time check. We've got like five more minutes. I was going to yeah. say if if we want to start keeping a list of the things we want to discuss further for the next portion of the morning, um, so we can have a table talking about pricing strategy. Yeah. I was going to say yeah. I'm a very strong believer that the price has nothing to do with the value yeah. received. Because ours and is I, free. If, it, if you can make your camp free, make it free. It is free. Like, I feel very strongly about making it so free. I think the short answer there is the opinion varies widely between camps. <laughs> and we all know that there are certain camps that say, hey, we're going to make our ticket, you know, $600, $500, $300, because that's, you know, a, a source of revenue and like that's the value of our camp. Um, Pika, GovCon's free, yeah. right? right. Um, I like to do you know. <laughs> well, I'm coming. <laughs> but it, it also, it, the, 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 the amount of money you need will determine that too. Well, um, and, and so, easy. yeah. I'm not saying it's easy, but I think, yeah. I think making it free so that you grow the audience so that, I hate to say this, but the audience is the thing that sells the camp. Right? Yep. The people yeah. who are there, the, the connections you make, Absolutely. that's what the attendees want, that's what the sponsors want, right? So yep. you yeah. don't have the audience. And, Yep. You remove one hurdle for the audience to grow, then that grows the audience. That's, in my opinion, the primary goal of having camp yep. is to grow and sustain an audience. That's yep. our value, is that we have been consistent for 10 plus years. Um, our sponsors continue to come back. People learn, the community is strong, and that is the value that we bring with yeah. Delcon. So yeah, I mean, mid camp we have, um, <laughs> our, our venue is pretty expensive, so we have a, a, a pretty kind of high bar. So our venue is, is like $15,000. Uh, so we have like almost $20,000 of basically fixed costs with the venue and, and, and food. Um, and so we, we've kind of tried doing like a tiered pricing model, but also making sure that we're, we're not using that as a barrier. Um, so we have, you know, our, our ticket price, quote unquote, is $200, but we have, this year we had discount codes that range from $0, uh, 25 for students, 50 for early bird, $100 for whatever. Uh, and so we, we tried to- <laughs> the website says that. <laughs> it says, just, yeah. I mean, basically, you know, sort of pay what you want, but also pay what you want is, is hard because giving people a free text field is, is, uh, is a harder question. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I, yeah. I, 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 I want to add a different perspective. I agree with everything that you've just said, and it really varies by, by event. For, for Drupal South, 
the venue this year cost $100,000 and sponsorships dropped. So for us, we had to raise the price of the ticket. Um, I'm in the future DrupalCon working group working with the DA as well. And there's conversations about, you know, what is the appropriate price of a ticket even for a DrupalCon? Mm -hmm. And to just add some, I don't have an answer to this, but to add some perspective, um, I, I know for certain people sending their teams, 60% of Drupal developers work in an agency or some sort of um, studio or dev house. And the cost of the ticket and the travel and the hotel, if it's necessary, all of that stuff um, is, it pales in comparison to lost revenue. So we've found, as we've raised our tickets, we've had very little feedback that's been negative about it. We've certainly had no feedback that was positive about it. Um, no one's come back and said, I'm glad you're charging more. But most people send their team to our event, which is a little bit more like a Drupal con than a camp, because um, it's a little bit more commercially focused. And for them, paying an extra $100 or $200 for a ticket doesn't matter because they're losing $1,500 a day. Sorry, no. Australian dollars, so <laughs> half it. Um, <laughs> they're, they're losing much more every day by sending that person. So that's the harder sell mm. for us. Um, we get about 30% of our revenue from ticket sales, 70% from sponsors. If we can make more from sponsors, mm. we will make a cheaper ticket. But in, in the reality for our specific circumstance, raising the price of the ticket hasn't been as significant. Cool. Yeah. And to okay. be fair, one yeah. more thing. Go for it, yeah. We are GovCon, so we have to have our tickets free because it makes it easier for yeah. people who are within the government to attend. Yeah. It reduces the amount of like things that they, hoops yeah. that they have to jump through to attend the conference. I'll, I'll second that as well. We, we, we ran an event last year that was more camp-like in, in Canberra, which is the capital city of Australia. Huge amount of government Drupal work there. Um, and we had a $50 ticket for regular people, like regular people being non-government employees. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and a fifty a, a free ticket if you had a .gov.au email address. Mm. And that was hugely popular. Yeah. Um, mm. And for sponsors as well, they really wanted to go. So it's not a... It really, really depends on the sort of event that you want to run, what's going to work. Yeah. So, I just go ahead, David. One thing. I, yep. I, I just echo what you said about GovCon. I think signaling the zero, the, it's free unless you want to pay, yep. unlocks an audience that would otherwise never consider. Like, mm -hmm. there, there's a tier of audience that are Drupal curious or Drupal aware or other, otherwise, like, intimidated by the idea of going to a Drupal conference, period. And yep. they say it's free. It's like there's no commitment. They can just kind of wander in. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's that, a that that kind of audience that's. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Okay. So, yeah. So what I'm hearing is there's going to be a ticket pricing table uh, <laughs> at the discussion <laughs> sessions. Uh, but I want to wrap up so we have time for Martin. Um, we want to say thank you uh, for everybody in this room uh, and everybody who's worked on events uh, for your contributions. Um, Local events really kind of keep all of this moving uh, throughout the year and, and make everything we do at DrupalCon and throughout the year possible. Uh, the event organizer working group um, goes on uh, all year long. We have monthly open meetings via Slack on the second Tuesday of the month uh, at 1600 UTC or noon Eastern. Uh, we have event organizers on Drupal Slack. Uh, and there's also a QR code here to join a newsletter and the issue queue. Um, so, Keep uh, engaging in the conversation. The more folks we have participating, the better we can all be. So thank you. And now, Martin. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> I can introduce myself. Okay.
All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Happy to have this opportunity to provide an update on the Drupal event platform and specifically some of the recent updates. So um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Martin Anderson Klutz on all the Drupal channels that go by ManClue. I'm a senior solutions engineer at Acquia and on a podcast that some of you may have heard called Talking Drupal. So what is the event platform? Anybody who's never heard of it before, it's a set of modules to provide configuration, to uh, create capabilities um, that are pretty common for, you know, particularly Drupal camps, but notionally, sort of by design, it's, it should be something that can be used for other types of events as well. And it actually started based on the website that had recently been built for Florida Drupal Camp 2022. Um, I did provide an update at last year's Drupal Camp in, uh, at the Community Summit in Pittsburgh, uh, but since then, some of the, the key features are there's a new scheduling interface, there's a flag-based My Schedule feature, and there's also a sub-module for managing BOFs. So uh, we'll see all of those in a few minutes. In terms of the architecture that it provides, it creates these different content types, so uh, sessions being probably the, the most key one, but also the ability to manage uh, sponsors, job listings, uh, connected to sponsors, the ability to have featured speakers, and then, again, the, the BOFs is that new feature. It also creates a series of vocabularies. So the uh, session time slots and rooms are actually done as taxonomies. And then uh, the audience categories and sponsor levels are all also vocabularies. Uh, the, some of the, the new functionality, it was actually written as sort of you know, PHP code as part of the event platform now. So there's a time slot generator to sort of, again, make it easy to set up. And then uh, there's a drag and drop scheduling interface, uh, kind of a visual grid. And we'll, again, see that in a couple moments. There are a variety of contrib modules that were built in to sort of um, put all of this together. So uh, I'm not going to read all of these. Happy to make these slides available for anyone um, who wants to go through these and, and look at them. Also, you know, easily available in the, the uh, composer.json if you uh, really want to geek out on this stuff. But all, the, the important thing is, is, you know, the solution that all of those put together provides. So you're going to have an easy to use UI, a single centralized form where you can manage the uh, information for your event, uh, the ability to have automatic notifications when a session is submitted, accepted, or rejected, and then some built-in spam protection as well. So with that, let's, uh, that's a lot of talk. Let's get hands-on and actually see what the event platform looks like. I should mention that if you go to the project page, so it's drupal.org slash project slash event underscore platform, there is also a demo video there that does a little bit more in terms of like the initial setup and that kind of stuff. I thought for today I would skip a little bit of that uh, in the interest of time so that we can focus on some of the newer features. So if we go in here, we can see this is sort of that form where you manage all of your event information. So like the name of your camp as an example, uh, what year the event is, uh, set the start and end date, and those will be used in a few different places as we'll see. And then you can sort of set different uh, calls, calls to action depending on sort of what's the, the current step that you want people to take. So um, maybe it's register, maybe later on it's submit a session. Um, you know, you can, can sort of change that over the life of your camp. And then if we look at the actual uh, page, what that does is on your home page, you're going to have this sort of like call to action block. Uh, if you put media into that form, uh, typically that's where it appear. And then in here is where you can sort of add your featured speakers or your sponsors. And if you go to the very bottom of the page, it'll even uh, use some of that information to automatically populate like a copyright statement as well. Um, so if we go in, uh, again, for the sake of time, I actually use like Devel to generate a bunch of different sessions and boffs. Um, but if we go back to the schedule that's created, uh, we can see that nothing has been scheduled, so the schedule is currently blank, which is an opportunity for us to use the scheduling interface. Now, if I go here, you'll notice that there's a little uh, notice saying there's no time slots, so we need to generate some. And there's a link to the time slot generator and so here's where it'll automatically populate based on the start and end dates that you put. Um, 
but in this case, maybe we want to say the last day of the camp, we want to do a contribution sprint, so we'll just sort of move the end date for generating time slots uh, back by a day. Uh, we could also sort of customize the start times and the durations, but for, again, the sake of our demo, let's just go ahead and use the defaults. And now that those have been generated, if we go back to our schedule interface, we can see that now we have this grid where on the left side, we have all of those time slots that were generated for the different days. And then the columns are for the different rooms. And then on the right-hand side, we have all of our different sort of sessions and boffs. And the process now to schedule those is a simple drag and drop to put these into, you know, which should be in which room at what time. We can also filter these. So maybe we want to say, let's go ahead and schedule all of our boffs to be in a single room, one after the other. You'll notice as I drag and drop some of these that it's highlighting rows in red. Uh, let me just switch back to these so that we can see some more of that. Actually, let's go ahead and schedule. Maybe we want to do the same thing and try and have sort of a beginner track. And you can notice here that it's got a row highlighted in red, and that's because the user who submitted this session uh, also has a BOF registered at that time. And so it's going to prevent you from scheduling the same speaker from having two sessions in the same time slot in two different rooms. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, I will say, like, I tried to, to give some thought into sort of like visual cues to sort of make things a little more obvious of what it's doing. Um, but to me, it's probably a little utilitarian. So if somebody out there is really passionate about front end and would like to make this prettier or like even better UX, I uh, would love to have uh, some collaboration here. So I'll just quickly throw these in here. Uh, let's maybe say we want to do the intermediate next. Uh, drop those in there. And let's just open up all the rest. Um, by the way, in case it isn't obvious, when you put the criteria in the filter, um, then the placed ones that you already have on the schedule are highlighted in yellow to, to sort of say that those are the ones that matched your current filter criteria. Um, okay, so let's just uh, drop some more in here. We could continue to schedule everything, but there's probably enough in the schedule already that whoop, you get the idea. So now if we go back to our site and look at the schedule, it's automatically created tabs for each of the days that we have sessions scheduled. It's going to group all of these uh, by time slot. And then the other thing that you'll notice is it has this little add to my schedule so that um, any user can go in and with a simple click, they can add these to sort of like a personal schedule. And then if you go up to the top, you can go view my schedule. And now you can see all of the things that you sort of tagged as like, I'm interested in, in going to that session or that boff. And the process to remove that is, you know, just as simple. So um, that's a quick overview. The, the boffs, I would say, again, are probably fairly basic right now. I don't know of any camp that's actually used them yet, so I haven't gotten any feedback. But would love to get some feedback and understand how that could probably work a little better. All right, uh, next thing I wanted to cover are some of the events that I know have used the event platform to date. So Drupal Dev Days in Vienna last year was one of the first. Uh, Twin Cities Drupal Camp uh, also used the event platform from what I understand. Uh, also Ned Camp this year, I'm sorry, Ned Camp uh, end of last year and Drupal Camp New Jersey this year. And an interesting one is the Polymer Processing Society in Spain. Uh, is it has recently created their, um, their event uh, campsite using the event platform, which I thought was pretty interesting. So a quick look, just to sort of show you that it's like, it's not prescriptive. You're not in any way forced to, to have it look a certain way. So you can see Drupal Dev Days in Vienna. This is sort of their main homepage, and this is what their schedule looked like. They did quite a bit of work to sort of give it a very unique look and feel. Twin Cities Drupal Camp, I feel like their theme ended up being to me, it looks fairly close to the uh, Florida Drupal Camp site. I don't know if they actually got maybe from that team their front end, but uh, I think that looks pretty good. But I mean, you can see they've, they've done a lot of work with the, um, 
the tabs to make them look um, pretty nice. Um, what, what are some of the things that I'm working on or, or have on the roadmap for 2024? Uh, certainly Drupal 11 readiness is a big one, especially knowing that uh, now it sounds like in July we'll have Drupal 11. Um, I think the, the potential um, slowdown there is going to be, you know, we, we talked about that list of um, dependencies, those, those other Drupal modules um, that are part of the solution, and so making sure that all of those are up to Drupal 11 in a timely manner is, is probably going to be the biggest lift there. Um, Drupal 11 is going to have recipes built in, actually even 10.3, so um, I feel like ultimately what's going to make the most sense is for the event platform to really be a set of recipes, and then those functional pieces that we saw really uh, sort of broken out into their own separate contrib modules. So have some ideas on, on how those could be maybe a little less opinionated, maybe potentially could be useful for other things, so um, that's certainly going to be on the roadmap. And then I do feel like today, any camp that's interested in using the event platform, probably the biggest lift is going to be, you know, making look the way you want. So some kind of a theme solution that could allow camps to sort of pick this thing up, get it installed, have it look, you know, sort of like the way they want it to look to reflect the identity of their camp without a ton of work. Um, I think there's definitely some value there. I had been thinking about a configurable version of Olivero, so like already you can use some CSS variables that you sort of like set through the admin UI to change up some colors, but maybe you could have more options. But um, you know, like all of us who earlier this week heard about Starshot and you know this idea of uh, being able to uh, sort of like completely customize your theme directly in the the website UI, that sounds like even better than what I had in mind. So I don't know, that's that's definitely open for discussion. Uh, some potential additions in terms of other modules that I think um, would probably make sense to be part of the solution or at least be sort of like on a list of recommended add-ons. Um, some of them are here. I think Path Auto at some point, I may just sort of bite the bullet and say that should be a requirement. Um, Jin admin theme, highly recommended. Drupal.org uh, username field is pretty interesting because the idea there, there is that you can connect, it'll connect to Drupal.org through the API and can sort of like bring over their profile information. So like as opposed to getting them to sort of manually fill out some of their, their profile information, be able to pull that from their Drupal.org field. So um, anyway, the idea of like reducing friction for as people sign up. So uh, what are some ways that, that the event platform can get better and even beyond what we're talking about, maybe even thinking further out? Uh, certainly having more documentation I think would be really helpful. There's already been discussion about how can we get the event platform to work for multi-year events. So, you know, uh, I don't want to have a, let's talk about, uh, you know, Drupal Camp New Jersey. They just built their website for the um, 2024. Come 2025, they shouldn't have to rebuild the site. There should be some way to sort of like have it simply roll over. Um, maybe the 2024 information is still available, but then when people are like creating sessions and all of those things, it's for 2025. So there's been some discussion about how that might be handled, potentially having like a taxonomy term or some other kind of entity for that. But um, again, would love to collaborate with anybody who has some experience working on a, a similar challenge. Um, today, uh, event platform uses Workbench email to send out emails. But uh, the same functionality could be done using ECA. And in fact, Mike Herschel actually uh, published a blog post about how he changed the Florida Drupal Camp website to do that. And I feel like having something really powerful like ECA built into the event platform would really allow for camp organizers to do potentially some very custom things without having to write custom code. So uh, I definitely think that's something worth pursuing. Um, as I mentioned, the boffs, you know, to me right now, like, they're there but they could be a lot better. Uh, when I think about the way a lot of camps uh, schedule boffs, you know, physically using like a whiteboard and markers, um, people can sort of pick which like room and time slot they want, so maybe some sort of like self-scheduling capability there would be, would be pretty cool. And then, you know, what makes most sense for how to display those? So right now, I don't think there's really any sort of like direct views capability with those, so maybe boffs should be included in the main views or have separate views, but again, would like to get some uh, feedback from camps on that. Potentially other roles, I think there's like a session administrator or session moderator role right now. And then of course, you know, Starshot is still a, a pretty big wild card. We don't really understand yet. Um, I, I feel like definitely long-term event platforms should be built to, to be run on top of that, but you know, what does that mean? 
we probably won't know for a few months yet. So how can you help? Uh, definitely uh, patches are welcome. Um, Drupal Camp New Jersey was great, opened up a couple of issues based on what they had found, but also tried to reach out to people from some of the other camps to understand you know, what worked well and what could have been better. Um, if you do have feedback and have tried it, certainly open an issue. Um, if you um, feel like maybe you're not as comfortable writing code but like to write documentation, again, would love to have some help on that. Um, happy to collaborate on a theme and even just letting us know if you use it. Uh, all of those are great ways to contribute. And uh, that's the talk. Okay, in, in just a few minutes, we'll have uh, Suzanne Durgacheva and Rosie Gladden talking about writing case studies, um, and they'll be leading a discussion about that. Um, so maybe if you wanna take a minute and have a stretch and grab a coffee and um, then we'll go straight into our discussion groups after uh, Rosie and Suzanne.
So we're gonna have your intro and then go straight into the breakouts or tables or whatever. <laughs> we'll just give people a minute to come back. I'm like, it's cool in here, but no, I'm drinking ice. So. <laughs> it is. It depends where you're sitting, because I was done. No, I may have just been stressed earlier, so that makes oh, me yeah. warm. But then we're going to go outside, know. and it's going to be Cause, actually yeah. hot. Because I wore a sweater this morning. But. <laughs> hmm? No, Ottawa. Oh. Yeah. So. Meeting up here. Well, I say Ottawa, but I'm actually in West Quebec, okay. which is kind of just as easy to get to Montreal or Ottawa yeah, kind of and I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I'm using your slides. <laughs> with, with all of your images intact, I just oh, kind of yeah. overwrote. Look at that. <laughs> That's our card images. Oh yeah, because um, I, I went to the branding thing yesterday, so I just clicked on the link, and apparently I already had access. I know some other people said they needed to be given access, but it just worked for me. So early this morning, I just cut and pasted all of my notes into. <laughs> Okay, we're going to get um, started again. We have one more introduction um, for our, our discussion tables this morning. Um, so we'll have Suzanne and Rosie talking about creating case studies. Um, and then what will happen is that we have um, some whiteboards and markers and sticky notes up at the front here so we can all just um, 
break out into tables to discuss whichever of our topics you want, or if you want to talk about something else entirely, feel free to start a table. Just take a whiteboard and um, invite other people to join you. And um, then just before lunch, we'll take a few minutes to have each discussion group tell us what they discussed. So if you can be prepared, somebody from your group to come up and share. And then we'll have lunch, and then we'll come back and do it again this afternoon. So, Suzanne, thank you. Sure. Um, so I'm uh, Suzanne Degacheva. I'm leading the Promote Drupal initiative. Um, and I, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm co-founder of Evolving Web, so I run a Drupal agency. Um, and so with those two backgrounds, I feel like I'm really, uh, my mission this DrupalCon was to try to spread the word that we need better case studies on Drupal.org. <clears throat> so, um, how many of you have checked out case, some, look, looked for a case study recently to tell a client you know, why they should use Drupal or to tell a client, this is how we use Drupal? Or maybe you looked at a case study because you were trying to figure out like, how did this other website, how was it built or what modules did it use or has anyone looked at a case study recently? Or wish that there was an awesome case study for something, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I was looking um, earlier this week or last week because I was trying to find like the best um, the best logos, the best examples of Drupal to just put in a general why Drupal pitch deck. And I was on Drupal.org and I was trying to figure out, okay, like where do I find all those top logos and where do I find you know the most relevant examples to, to show to a client. Um, so I invite you all, if you're, if you're got your, uh, some of you have your laptops open or, or whatnot, you know, open up Drupal.org. You can see, um, uh, if you, you, you know, it won't take you too long to, to find, like, okay, under use cases, this is where the case studies are, and things are, are organized, right? For, this is, where, this is where we find case studies, is that right? So here we can dig into some case studies like this. Sometimes they're organized you know, on these kind of industry landing pages. Um, and we can also go under Why Drupal and find a list of all the case studies that we can filter. And if you start to look through these case studies, and maybe you've written some of these yourself, you'll find that what people tend to do is, um, and I know because this is what we do at Evolving Web, is we have this great case study that we've published on our own website, and then somebody says, oh yeah, shouldn't we put that on Drupal.org? And then it's a copy-paste job to, to move it over. So maybe I don't want to pick on anybody. anybody. Um, but I know that's exactly what we do. And oh, this is a lovely looking site, Perimeter Institute. It's a Canadian institution, higher education. I picked an image X one. <laughs> um, it's a really nice looking site. And so it talks about, you know, it, it does say something about why Drupal was chosen, but they tend to be written really from the perspective of the, the agency built this site, and this is what the agency kind of achieved with the project in collaboration with the client. Like that tends to be how um, case studies get written. And so what we wanted to talk about a little bit today is how to orient your case studies um, more around um, talking about Drupal and um, positioning Drupal a little bit more. And it doesn't mean that you have to rewrite things from scratch, but um, uh, tends to be uh, some light edits that can really um, just help make make the case studies more appropriate for for something that we can put up on Drupal.org. 
Uh, so we have some guidelines to share and then also just some general best practices about case studies. So maybe I'll pass it to Rosie to talk a bit more about. Yeah, I'll just um, briefly say why I'm here. Uh, so I'm Rosie, I'm um, the marketing VP at ImageX. So I've been in the Drupal community for about six years now, working with Suzanne on Promote Drupal for about uh, three and a half of those. Um, I'd like to say this is a done on purpose, a case of how not to do it on Drupal.org. Um, Suzanne's point of copy and pasting is completely accurate. Um, my background, fully marketing, non-technical non person um, for about 15 years and been writing case studies for most of those but with very much a kind of marketer hat on, not a community hat. So hoping to bring some of those um, pieces of knowledge and apply those from a community perspective and how we can get better case studies for Drupal specifically and getting that message out into the wider, the wider world. Um, you know, more people on Drupal, more clients for us, hopefully, um, and more, um, you know, opportunities for everyone in the room. So, yeah, looking forward to working with everyone. Come to our table. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I might just um, walk a little bit through the case study um, guidelines that we have up here just to share a little bit and um, give, you a, give you an idea. Um, I want to think of the best way to share this link with all of you because it's kind of long. Uh, the Slack channel for the community summit. Oh, there's a Slack channel? Do you want to post the thing? Okay, so uh, Rosie's going to post the link to these guidelines in the Slack channel because it might be hard to find this, doc this documentation page otherwise. Um, but uh, so just to kind of give you an or orient you a little bit about the guidelines. So we, we didn't want to make them too onerous. Uh, we didn't want to say like, well, people have to spend hours and hours rewriting their case studies. So um, I think what's really important is that when you are um, looking at putting your case study on Drupal.org, you think about one of these one of these themes. So um, you know, a case study doesn't have to pull all the weight of somebody's decision of choosing Drupal, but it would be nice if it could, um, you know, highlight some of the features of Drupal. Talk about how. Um, how this Drupal project is, is innovative. Some, some projects, of course, are more innovative than others. Sometimes it's just a marketing website that you're putting out there. So not every project has to show like, oh, we're using the latest cutting edge thing or you know, um, using React or something very um, more modern. But you know, if, if, if you're, uh, you can pick one of these, um, it might be that Drupal is just a much better um, fit for the, your organization than for the organization than the previous CMS. So that could be something that you highlight. Um, I know often we don't want to write case studies that are too negative because we don't want it to make it seem like, oh, the the previous website was horrible. Um, and we're always trying to be very positive, um, but. If we can find a way to position Drupal as just being a better better option than what the client was using before, um, or or even if it just illustrates the value of open web, maybe you're able to achieve something really fast, um, or leverage existing modules, um, or um, empowering content editors to be able to do to do more uh, independently. These are all kinds of themes that. Are, I think are really powerful and that really help people make that decision around what CMS to pick. So um, trying to have the description of the, the case study, especially somewhere in the first part of the case study, because people tend to not read the full case study anyway, but maybe in the first paragraph or two to, to really highlight one of these things would be great. Of course, you could do all of them, but... Um, at least, at least one. Um, and then in terms of the style guide, this is more around the actual writing. So there's a few things here just to, um, just to uh, bring attention to. So, so one of them is um, 
using the word Drupal at the beginning of a few sentences instead of just the name of the agency that built the website, um, using the latest version of Drupal instead of um, Drupal specific versions like talking about, oh, Drupal 10 is the best. Well, Drupal 11 is going to come out soon and then your case study is going to seem really dated. So talking more about the latest version of Drupal instead of emphasizing the version number um, or just using the word Drupal um, if, it's, if the version isn't relevant, then that's, that's probably going to be preferable. And then I think one of the hardest things is, is to avoid uh, jargon and Drupalisms. So there's actually an initiative out there now to like identify Drupalisms because sometimes when we're really in the community a long time, we forget that the word module or node, this means different things to other people. Um, but even a word like recipes, which I kind of assumed was something people would immediately understand. It's a kind of a developer word. So if you're talking about Starshot and recipes and all this fun stuff, it, it might be something that um, isn't instantly recognizable by other people. And then there's just some more um, uh, general, general things like avoiding um, acronyms or spelling them out. Um, so that's all part of the, the more style of the content. And then there's also some guidelines here around, around the images, which I think are pretty self-explanatory. Um, so, uh, did we manage to put the link in the Slack? Jim? Okay. The Slack, however, is a private channel, so while I'm waiting for somebody to turn it public, if you want to join the Slack, just come and see me. Now. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. And then there's a link here to, also on this page, to actually add your case study so we can see, you know, there's a form here you can, you can put things. So as long as you're, a, I believe any confirmed user can publish case studies on Drupal.org. And creating a case study is actually you know, a big important part of contribution. So there's contribution credits if you're um, you know, looking to do more contribution that's credited. Um, it's a great thing to contribute to. Um, so. And, uh, and some case studies on Drupal.org, like I've been kind of speaking as an agency owner where, and, and Rosie as well, like we're publishing case studies about work we've done with clients. But if you are a um, end user of Drupal, you, you know, you're using Drupal at your university or um, whatever kind of institution or company you work for, you can also publish a case study for your own project. So it doesn't have to be, you know, agency um, written or agency driven. Um, so I'll just pause there. To, uh, actually, I should have maybe started with this because I didn't join first thing this morning. But how how many of you are? Um, I don't know. What do we say? Like, how do we want to? How many of you actually work for uh, agencies? Yeah. Okay. Quite a number. And um, how many of you are uh, writers or marketers in some capacity or maybe project manager who does some, can do some writing? Okay, so, so some people in the room, that's great. Yes, questions. That's a good question. Do you have guidance, Rosie? Sorry. I don't speak very loudly. So. Um, I would say always kind of between 600 to 1,200. Um, effectively, less is more. Conciseness is um, obviously the perfect, the idea situ ideal situation. Um, people want things very quickly, very digestible. Uh, if you have the capacity to do video case studies, that's even better, um, but yeah, uh, I would say up to about, probably up to 1,500 words total, um, and focusing on how you can break that down for ease of re reading, much like most landing pages and things. Yeah, and these guidelines are new, like they're only published recently. I don't think that many people have used them, so if you 
use these and say, oh, this doesn't make sense, please let us know, <laughs> because I don't think they've been like fully, like the tires have not been fully kicked. Um, and in terms of length, uh, I know like, yeah, less is more. And what I think I see a lot is like a marketing website that's not, it doesn't have that many features and then the case study sometimes is super long and it just says, we made it easier to use. We streamlined the navigation and just kind of repetitive generic statements a lot. Um, and so I would avoid that um, as a you know, brutal editor. I go in and just say, cut this, cut that. Um, but if, for example, it's a really, um, let's say, you know, our company recently did a website with a lot of data visualizations and integrated with, you know, mapping API. So there were, there were a lot of innovative kind of technical details to add. And I wouldn't shy away from adding some of that because if we're looking at the, you know, this whole thing, we're trying to improve the evaluator experience and give people who are considering Drupal, um, you know, information that they need. So if they see, oh, well, my project also has these features, or I also need to do something a little bit different with Drupal, if you're going to be helping that person make their choice or figure out not just that they need to use Drupal, but like here's some um, more information about what Drupal can achieve or how they can do their project, I think that's all very useful. So you have to kind of use your judgment a bit, maybe with the length. I'll just, um, I'll just add to that. That's very much with the mindset as well that we're talking about case studies for Drupal.org. So where um, I would just say think of your audience. So Suzanne, on your agency site, you might have that slightly higher level talking to marketers, whereas with this specifically, the more detail you can get in and the more kind of benefits to end users and how Drupal supports that, then that's the ideal. Table time. <laughs> Is that right, Okay, so we're going to break up now into tables to discuss all of these things. Or, like I said before, if you have something else that you want to discuss and you can find somebody else to talk to, then um, just grab a whiteboard and some markers, and we have about an hour to talk, and then we'll have lunch. And at our table, we're going to workshop a case study. So if you want help with yours, come to our table because we need a use case, a test case. <laughs> we, we lost that project to you guys. So.